Thank you for, for having me here. Thank you to the Polish Institute of Culture for, for supporting uh, this beautiful event. Yes, uh, as it was mentioned, I, I arrived yesterday and I had a long walk uh, through the city. I even seen some magic trick show and also the live jazz concerts. So beautiful city uh, of Sofia. I would like to tell you today a little bit about how we can build with the use of paper, which seems to be not, um, not official material, it is not an official building material. However, famous Japanese architect Shigeru Ban said once that the good design can create strength from weakness. And actually he proved that by building paper church after the great earthquake in Kobe, 1995, he built uh, the paper church, which was temporary structure. Uh, but actually, after 11 years, in 2006, this church was moved to Taiwan. And now it's there as a permanent structure. So then the question is, what does it mean, permanency or temporality in architecture? On the other hand, we had a strategy three years ago in Paris where the building which was associated with the eternal symbol of Paris actually burned almost down within three days. So then again the question, what is eternity, what is permanency, what is temporality in architecture arise. And then the paper comes. Uh, most of you know the paper from everyday objects, uh, I believe, such as uh, paper cups or in dramatic moments, the uh, rolls when the toilet paper finishes. Paper, cardboard, the same materials, because sometimes people think that uh, those two different, there are two different materials, but not, they are exactly the same. And what is characteristic for paper is that you can imagine it's a kind of a portion of spaghetti poured on the table and left to dry, because if you look at the spaghetti and paper, there is a lot of similarity because the main building component of paper is cellulose fibers. And those fibers, they create hydrogen bonds between each other, thanks to that paper gain all its mechanical properties. Do you know what is it? Any ideas? Actually, this is the nest of the wasps and hornets that the photo was taken in Kyoto at, in, the, in, in front of the Museum of Modern Art, and you, you can see that this nest was built at the edge of the cardboard box. And that discovery in 18th century uh, by French and German scientists uh, led to the mass production of paper, because before paper was made mainly out of uh, old uh, rocks, uh, rocks and uh, nets, linens, and so on. When the scientists noticed that uh, wasps and hornets, they chew um, bark of the tree, mix it with their saliva, and then create these little houses, they thought, okay, if they can do it, we can do it as well. And that was actually the, the big revolution in paper industry. So from that time, paper uh, uh, have started to be made out of timber. All the trees which are cut in United States, Canada, Europe are from the um, the certified forestry. Actually, the notion of um, sustainable development comes from the forestry. It means that as many trees are grown as they cut to, for, to, for the building industry, other industry, inclu industries, uh, including paper industry. Uh, production of paper is a huge line these days, and what is characteristic that paper have uh, directions of fibers, so 80% of the fibers are along the machine, which is called the machine direction. If you take a, a sheet of paper and you tear it from both sides, you can see that from one side, perhaps it will be the longer side, the fibers will be longer, and this is the machine direction which makes paper stronger in this direction. Paper was uh, initially not dis uh, discovered, not invented, but discovered in China in 105, and from there it was uh, transferred to Korea, then to Japan, then to the Arabic world, and finally to Europe. The traditional way of making paper, this is the photo I, I took in the little village of uh, Echizen in Japan, 
and they produce paper with the same method, the same manner, from one and a half thousand years. Not the same guy, but the same uh, production spot. And what they do, it's like they put the sieve into the slurry where the fibers are, and they shake it in one direction, the other direction, and finally they put it aside. However, the contemporary production of paper is a mass production and there are hundreds of meters per minute produced. That's why the paper is so cheap and available everywhere in the world. But what about paper and architecture? How, how those two can be combined? How those two uh, cooperate? Well, we can use several product, products which are available on the, on the market. Uh, those are a full board, paper tube, which perhaps you know from the um, toilet paper, paper towels, and so on. But if we would make them bigger, then they become really strong. Corrugated cardboard, honeycomb panels, and then L-shapes and U-shapes. Maybe I can pass this through the audience so you can touch it, try to squeeze it, and in the meantime, I will explain about those materials. First one, uh, honeycomb panel. Actually, honeycomb panel is a very simple but very wise solution. You have a structure which looks like a honeycomb nest and then two liners, two facings from the top and from the bottom. I'm not sure if you're aware, but this very table is made exactly with the same material. And it can hold 50 uh, kilograms. This is the official, but I think that I would stay. I'm uh, heavier than that. I would stand on it on this it would last my weight. So it's very good material for planar elements, like a walls, divisions, floors, roofs. Another element, corrugated cardboard, which every one of you know from boxes. Uh, the, the characteristic here lies in the, in the flute, so sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, depending on the properties we want to gain. And this product is made in such a way that there is a corrugation medium going inside and then liner from one side and the second liner from the other side and they are all laminated together. Then, paper tubes. There are actually two ways to produce paper tubes. One by parallel winding and the other one by spiral winding. Much more popular and actually the second one is called infinitive production because by um, spiral winding you can create as long tube as you would like to. Uh, the, the limitation is the production, uh, the size of the factory or the transportation uh, size. And the tube I sent through the audience, actually it could uh, stand I think 1.7 or 2 thousand kilograms so you can put a small car on top of it. And finally, the full board, uh, which can have shape of uh, planar elements or L-shapes or U-shapes. Very good elements for uh, beams or pillars, so uh, frame structure, for example. How those transferred into architecture? Obviously, paper is always uh, connected with traditional Japanese architecture. Here you can see the example. This is. Um, uh, Nazenji temple, traditional very old temple from 15th century in Kyoto. Here you have the panels, so-called fusuma panels, so opaque panels with paintings, and here shoji panels, which allow light to go through. Both are made out of paper. It is said that Japanese architecture actually is made of timber and paper. The reason for that is then when there is a strong wind suddenly coming, uh, then the paper can be blown away and the main structure would stay intact. But when we think about contemporary Western, let's say, architecture, I guess this picture comes to our minds. It doesn't have to be like that, because we can create very, very different things, starting from furniture through temporary pavilions, venues, cultural venues, uh, housing, even school or university public buildings, ending with the emergency architecture, which I would like to talk about a little bit at the end of the lecture. So, furniture, those two chairs. This chair is made out of corrugated cardboard glued together. I believe that the material for this chair cost around 50 euros. It's made by famous uh, architect, Frank Gehry. It was made in uh, 1967. And the other chair, by, mentioned by me, Shigeru Ban, Japanese architect, 
Uh, the, in this chair, the paper tubes and the timber elements were used, so I believe it might be a little bit more expensive, let's say 70 euros for the material. How much they cost now? What do you think? If you would like to buy them. Yes. 15? One five? More. 400. Ah, more. Yeah, this one can be bought from uh, Vitra from 1,200 euros, and this one, if I'm correct, 870 euros. So the name, the design, doesn't have to be very expensive material. We also tried to build some furniture together with our students at the Wrocław University of Science and Technology in Wrocław. Uh, we made an uh, exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art and we tried to combine different uh, materials, try them, as you can see here. Uh, we used some timber elements, paper tubes, honeycomb panels, uh, and so on. We create lamps, armchairs, table. In general, we like to have our hands dirty and work with this material because this is the experimenting is the best way to try to test to understand how the material behaves and now i'd like to show you a short movie which will uh, represent what we actually did last summer with our students during our workshops uh, <laughs> You can see a lot of cardboard around, but also timber and other materials. Students from different universities uh, combined into the working groups and they created uh, six different projects. Pavilions, furniture, uh, there was even emergency house, this one, but it's not made of paper, uh, for refugees. And there are students from Ukraine who were invited. Uh, this is our experimental house and this is the furniture which is movable and transformable. This is the furniture for the school. It was altogether two weeks workshop. One week was online design part, then the students arrived to Wrocław and one week for production. Finally, the prototypes, the paper house, the tea pavilion, the pavilion for the Lemon Fun Festival, the movable uh, and the world, uh, wardrobe for, for, the, for the school. What is beautiful in those moments is when you see how students develop their skills and learning by mistake is the best way to learn. And obviously, uh, they, all, they are all proud uh, at the end of the results. So, saying that, uh, said that, that we like to have our hands dirty, we uh, continue to build different uh, elements, furniture, pavilions, with the use of cardboard and paper, because they are the same. Here, for example, we have, an exam uh, we have a work and roll, which is the furniture that you can rotate, and depending on the position, it can be used in a different way. Uh, sometimes you can work, sometimes you can just lie and uh, rest, and actually it works. Once I was uh, passing by the main uh, library of our university, I've seen, some I've seen some students sleeping in there, so I thought, okay, it works. Yeah? It's, a, it's, a, it's a best proof. 
Uh, this pavilion was made for the European um, Paper Week, the biggest actually European um, conference for paper industry. And it was titled Paper Cave. The idea was that from the outside you, you would see this kind of a stiff box. However, when you go inside, you have a feeling of being in a cave where five products of industry from uh, five products or innovative products from paper industry uh, were presented. Then we went outside, so we built something bigger together with students. And this is the forest pavilion which refers to the poetry of famous Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert. He used quite often in his, po uh, in his poems the, the um, allegory of, of, of the woods, of forests, of trees. So students designed this kind of a box which can be opened and uh, then the, the base is made of timber. The tree trunks are just simple paper tubes and the corrugated cardboard is the crown of the, of the, of the trees from which the paper leaves with the poetry lies, uh, flows down. We made the tests, we prepared uh, everything in our workshop and then uh, finally uh, we presented in the, in the main uh, building of the in, the, in the courtyard of the main building uh, of the university. Here you can see the leaves of this tree, of this, uh, tree crown with the poetry. Uh, well, the pavilion was supposed to stay for like three weeks we, because it was an experiment and this is how it looked in um, July 2018, then finally December and then in, uh, in March they asked us to disassemble it and most of the material was recycled because it was simple paper. Another pavilion, that was the Pavilion, for, pavilion of Freedom, 1989, 19, uh, 2019, 30 years after the free election in Poland. Perhaps you know the Berlin Wall, or, and the students wanted to refer to that. However, here you can see that this very huge structure, it's like 11 meters long, is just uh, um, positioned in a three point, so it's kind of floating or flying away. And from the, from the up, you can see the, the sign of the victory, which was a very popular sign in the 80s uh, by the movement of solidarity in Poland. Each, each site had different functions, so short history uh, from the war to the 1989, and then the whole thing was made out of uh, honeycomb panels together with the, with the plywood from, from the site. Um, the other pavilion we built uh, referred to the profession of architect. Everyone see architect as a kind of an engineer, which design houses, always wearing black. There are books about that. So we decided to design something like a typical house from the inside, where you walk in. However, each architect has his crazy or her craziness, huh? so this explosion of creativity. And this is what we, and this is how we wanted to present it from the outside. So this white parametrically designed surface uh, refers to this craziness of the arts, ar artists or architects. It was simply made of um, um, uh, honeycomb panels uh, frames connected together and then from the side, uh, from the inside, the paper tubes were slid outside to extend the, the skin, the outer skin, which was lighted later on. And this pavilion also lasts for one year in the city of Opole because it was built from the International Day of Architecture. This is one of the uh, authors, Veronica. She didn't pass away, she just took a photo from, 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 uh, from the below. Another pavilion, here we again uh, kind of refer to the idea of temporality and eternity in architecture. So what we did here, we copy the vault, the Gothic vault, uh, from the Museum of Architecture with the use of very fragile, you would say, material as paper. So uh, together with our uh, partner, the producer of paper tubes, we created curved paper tubes and those tubes represent the interior of the Museum of Architecture, which is old monastery in Wrocław. So we kind of recreate that and we wanted to start a discussion, yeah, what is architecture for us if we live for like 80, 90 years and architecture stays for hundreds of years and then of course we change our needs during the lifetime and how architecture can adapt to it. Mm, we use paper tubes and timber 
joints. Uh, we enlightened it, and uh, same story. It was um, designed as a, as a temporary building or structure. However, after one year, we were asked to dismantle it and uh, dump it. And the last pavilion from our side was the biggest uh, structure to date. Um, pa pa pavilion for the 70th anniversary of our university. Some people call it a hedge the hawk uh, because it was made of timber uh, frames and 492 paper tubes. Uh, when they arrived to the university, to our production hall, some of the students immediately fall in love with the material. And I'm not surprised because paper has something common with timber, which is uh, the softness, the warmth when you touch it. I even like the smell. Never tasted it yet, but uh, maybe I will have a chance. Um, yeah, so the pavilion was made out of timber arcs connected together, six different types, and then they created this kind of 11 meter long shape, very soft. And thanks to that, we could create also uh, the exhibition on different levels. We did the flat crash test to see if the pavilion will withstand the wind loads. And uh, we built components, six components like that. They, will, they were transferred or transported to the main square of the city of Wrocław and combined together. Inside, there was an exhibition uh, which told the story about the, the university. On the lower level, some quizzes and questions for kids. On the higher levels, more serious information for adults. But the best of that was that each of these 900, uh, 492 tubes was enlightened and separately uh, remoted, uh, controlled. So. The pavilion was kind of a, Wrocław is called a city of meeting, and that was a meeting spot in the city of meeting. So when I checked this place, it's I think uh, it's dusk, so four o'clock in the morning, I was constantly there checking if everything is fine. I could see couples going through, kissing, hugging. So we really created some of a special place in, this, in, the, in the heart of the city. Which, uh, yeah, which was the, 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 the biggest success, I think, of that project. Now we're going back to the Japanese architect, Shigeru Ban. He's also my, my teacher and my master, and I was very, very much inspired by his works. Here you can see the museum, nomadic museum, so the museum that can be trans, uh, transported from place to place. The museum is made out of 214 shipping containers rented on site, and the main nave is made out of paper tubes 10 meter high and 1 meter in diameter. And then the, team, uh, the paper tube structure for the roof. If you go inside of this museum, you have a feeling that you're in kind of a temple or church. And there were big photos, about 5 by 3 meters exposed. The whole exhibition could be uh, transported to the other location within only 14 containers and the other 200 were rented uh, on place. So first time it was built in New York, then it was transferred to Los Angeles and then to Tokyo. Here is a Tokyo version which is shorter because there was no, not so much space, uh, but then they have two naves, so two, uh, two museums actually standing next to each other. Another example, temporary structure, uh, this time is the geodesic dome. And that was a uh, temporary structure for the theater in Eiburg in the Netherlands. You can see uh, how many paper tubes were used here with the steel rod connection. And all this structure was covered by PVC um, um, fabric membrane to prevent uh, the, the, the influence of water, of course. And the biggest pavilion ever built was Japan was Shigeru Ban. Uh, he designed it together with famous uh, German structural engineer and architect Frei Otto. This pavilion had 75 meter long, 35 uh, span uh, width, and about 17 to 25 meter height. Um, the structure lies on the paper tubes, which were put one on, on top of each other and then connected with the elastic tape, as this one. And then slowly, slowly, the whole structure was put up 
and the tubes got curvature, and then finally they were fixed to the ground and got this shape. The gable wall, back and the end wall, were created with the use of honeycomb panels with the aluminum joints. And first ever permanent structure built with the use of paper uh, tubes was the paper house by Shigeru Ban. It's his summer house. Here he used 118 paper tubes put in the C shape and they divide the house to the living space with the kitchen. This is the um, uh, communication with the uh, toilet in a big tube. 105, uh, 150 cm in diameter. Shigeru uh, jokes that in case of emergency, if your paper, toilet paper runs out, you can always tear something from the wall. And here you have a little bathroom with private garden, also uh, surrounded by paper, paper tubes. Beautiful view from the house, minimalistic architecture. And here you can also see, uh, if I go back, uh, these panels, the glass panels, uh, movable panels, they refer to these shoji panels, the traditional Japanese architecture uh, solutions. A very interesting idea from the Netherlands this time uh, is Wickelhaus. From Dutch, Wickel means to wrap. And uh, the creator of this house, René Schnell, he uh, he's seen how the little boxes for tomatoes are made. And they are made by spanning the core and wrapping um, layers of corrugated cardboard, which are glued together. And he thought, okay, if we'll make a bigger mold that we can wrap a whole house, maybe that would work. And it did. Uh, so this is the mold. The corrugated cardboard is provided from here with the glue. And this is the segment, which is this mold rotates. Uh, subsequent layers of paper are wrapped glued and this segment is taken away and connected with the other segments. The producers give 15 years warranty for that. However, they promise that this house should last at least for 50 years. However, on the other side, no one checked it yet because they started production, the mass production, a few years ago. But I believe it is possible. Uh, and this is the section of the wall, so you can see the layers of corrugated cardboard with plywood from the outside, inside and the outside, and some core inside. This is mainly to connect with the steel roads, the uh, subsequent um, segment. This is the oldest European example of the permanent building. It was built in 2001. It's a, um, a social club from primary school. Uh, the outer, uh, the walls are made of honeycomb panels covered with the cement plates, also same with the roof. The structure is made of paper tubes. However, you can see the traditional elements like a timber and the steel elements. The school was built in 2001 and it was uh, expected to be used for about 20 years. Last year, my PhD student contacted the company, the, the, the designers, and uh, then they sent the photo. Uh, you can see that it's still in use, a little bit dirty here and there, but intact. So more than 20 years, at least, such a structure can last. Answering to the possible question, what is temporality and uh, permanent paper architecture? Here we go back to Japan again. So this is the studio for the Kyoto University of Art and Design, which is made out of paper tubes connected with the thread roads. Uh, screwed together. Thanks to that, you don't make any hole in paper tubes, so the risk of the moisture and water going in is limited. And they pre-stress them, so they, 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 uh, they use the best properties of paper tubes, which is um, uh, compression. And several rows of such arcs are connected to each other, covered with plywood and the PVC on top, in, the, in between, there is uh, styrofoam for thermal insulation. Uh, thanks to the use of metal elements, this uh, uh, university studio, which was in Kyoto, was dismantled and moved to Tokyo at the Keio University, where uh, Shigeru Ban is professor now, and it's still in use, so it can travel. 
um, another building, school building, this time after the big earthquake in 2008 in Chengdu, uh, Western China. Uh, Shigeru Ban, together with voluntaries and students, they decided to design and build several, three actually, primary school buildings with the use of paper tubes. Here you can see the frames connected with the timber joints, which looked like that. Uh, and there was a competition, three teams, they worked parallelly during the summer holidays, so like two months they built all three buildings. This is the photo I took in 2013. Uh, and the school was in use after five years. And I took this picture when I was on the way to little town of uh, Yan, next to Chengdu, where in, two, in um, April 2013 was uh, a huge earthquake which destroyed actually the city in about 70%. The interesting situation was that about... Um, uh, somewhere in the 80s, people started to replace timber structures with the Mm, mm, uh, brick structures, because they thought it's more privileged or expensive material. However, this timber structure, they had so-called genius loci, so the spirit of the place, the, the knowledge given by the generations, how to withstand the earthquakes, right? And the timber buildings survived, uh, some of them, and most of the brick buildings, they just collapsed. So we went there, and so we built a school, kindergarten, uh, which was called Miao Miao, which in Chinese means freshly grown grass. It's a beautiful name. Uh, the, the paper tubes were connected with timber joints. You can see here a lot of bracing because it was a potentially dangerous place because of the earthquake. So the whole structure was uh, kind of uh, embraced and, and then stiffened. Uh, and here you can see the first row, uh, 236 millimeters diameter paper tube, 15 millimeters thickness of the wall, timber joints, and then one row after another. It's me here. So I, my father was laughing that I was, because I was the tallest one, I, I worked there as a crane. I was just taking all the things which were above the other colleagues from, from China and Japan. And finally, this is, the fi uh, this is how the building looked like when it was opened to, to public in March 2014. The same month, uh, Shigeru Ban, not because of this building, but because of his whole career, Shigeru Ban was awarded with Pritzker Prize, which is recognized as a Nobel Prize for architects. And uh, the reason was, first of all, that he really worked for the people he needs, like in the uh, crisis. And the second one was that he always experiments with materials like paper, or here you can see he used those uh, L-shapes, perforated L-shapes, which are normally used to build uh, shelves in the magazines, right? But he, in, the, in this case, he used them uh, for, the, for the roof structure. Oh uh, yeah, and this is the building uh, at the day of opening, so I think it's March 2014. So we came to, to the final uh, final chapter, uh, which is the emergency architecture, and there are several um, types of shelters. I mean, before you could see the schools, but now the most important is a housing, right? person without a house lost all the safety and uh, uh, has no covering of the uh, physiological needs. So here you can see, this is called the Maslow, Abraham Maslow uh, pyramid, which is simplified um, pyramid of the needs of human. First, first you have the physiological needs, then safety needs, then love belonging, then esteem and self-authorization. When, when we talk about emergency or relief architecture, those first needs should be uh, fulfilled by function-focused design. So it means that we don't care about the, the visual side or the comfort, it should function somehow. And then uh, uh, consumer-focused, so then we fill up another needs and then human-focused. However, Shigeruban always says that the aesthetics of any design, even if it's for homeless people or victims of natural or human-made disasters, is of primary need. That's why his buildings, even though very simple sometimes, I always always have this kind of a beauty inside. The relief architecture, housing architecture, can be divided in several types. 
First is emergency shelter, which is needed immediately after, after the situation, after the war, after the earthquake, after the flood. Uh, and people stay there, should stay there for days. Then we talk about temporary shelter, sometimes tents, the United Nations High Commissioner tents are used for that. And then temporary housing, which should be used for months or years. Finally, permanent house in the place where the, the thing occurred, for example, after the earthquake, rebuilding the city, or after the war, coming back to the city. As you may all know, or we all know, what happened in uh, February uh, this year when, when Russia attacked Ukraine. There was a, a huge amount of refugees that fled uh, fle to Poland, 4.5 million. Actually, now there are 1.4 million officially registered Ukrainian refugees in Poland. 7.1 million in whole Europe, and there are also 7 million so-called internally displaced people in Ukraine. So it's a huge problem also in the west part of Ukraine. Um, just after this situation, Shigeruban called to my colleague uh, Hubert Trammer, who contacted me, uh, to propose some solution for refugees which uh, were gathered in the big places such as gymnasiums or railway stations or old shops like Tesco or something. And we created together a very simple system which is called paper partition system. Actually paper, paper tubes which uh, slit one to another and then on top of that there is a, yeah, then they create this kind of a structure and then they are divided with the safety pins and uh, textile. Thanks to that, these little rooms, by about two by two meters, uh, can give some kind of privacy. And it did work, because one of my colleagues told me that uh, when the refugees moved into such a rooms, they started to cry, which means that all the tension they have on all the way from their home to Wrocław, which is all the way through Poland, they, they were all tested. So it's actually medical help, huh? so to, to relieve all the, all the stress you have inside of your body. That was a very touching moment. I took my students to the eastern part of Poland, in the city of Helm. The, that was kind of an exchange station, because the, 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 the Ukrainian refugees came to Helm, stayed one or two days, and then they moved further to Poland, and first refugees came in. So that was really, really touching, and then you could see they had those little compartments or rooms to stay a few, uh, few days. The whole thing was composed in home from 320 units, almost 318 units, uh, which were divided in kind of uh, districts. So we had a main square for people who just wanted to see it, wait a few hours and take a bus. They all came from here. Here was the rest buffet, so they, they were fed here. Here was the shop for all the things which were uh, needed for kids. And here was the bathroom section with the, and the laundry section. Here was the, 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 the warehouses and the offices for the voluntaries. And from that side, there were like every day hundreds of uh, clothes or blankets uh, delivered to the place. Um, because we asked for help, we got very different textile, very different materials. So we had yellow, pink, brown, but that helped because we created actually different districts. So there was a yellow district, pink district, blue district, white district, and so on and so on, which also helped to understand the space by the refugees. Here you can see uh, it's not full map. I mean, there are more points because it was uh, over 18 places in Ukraine and also all over Europe where this system was uh, created. But if we go a little bit further, step further, then we have to think about something more permanent, which is, uh, for example, in this case, paper lockhouse. Very simple structure built in 1995 after the earthquake. Uh, so the same time, the same earthquake when the church was built, I showed you at the beginning. So this is the same, uh, the same event. Uh, Shigeruban designed a very simple structure. First he used the beer crates filled with the sandbags, then timber floor with paper tubes put on top, and then with the paper tube structure he created a uh, roof made of PVC um, membrane. Uh, we thought, okay, that's, that works good, but maybe not in our 
um, uh, climate conditions. So we thought about our own solution with the use of paper. And then the idea of transportable emergency cardboard house appeared, which is uh, in short tech. Uh, first uh, trials were did at U Delft. Uh, we did several um, prototypes to, to check what type of material we can use in what way. Uh, we did the, 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 the strength test and then the second edition, because first was just a design, was the full house, very experimental one. Then we built the third one within the European Capital of Culture, so we got this prize and we were able to, to build the prototype. The idea was that with those two different types of the shelter, of the houses, you can combine them in different arrangements depending on the needs. So sometimes few families, sometimes 12 guys, sometimes one small family. Uh, and we also imagine it can be arranged for 50 people in such a housing estate or maybe in more like a Roman, uh, ancient Roman uh, camp for about 500 people. Uh, yeah, and then we created uh, the prototype with the use of honeycomb panels, L shapes, uh, and some timber elements for uh, for connection. Very small unit, which was also um, empowered by the by the PV uh, panels, and it was exposed to the to the city of Wrocław. When we talked about that before we showed that, people were like, "Ha." Ah. Paper house, house of cards, what's that? What's a stupid idea? Then finally, when they've seen it, they ask me, okay, where we can buy it? How much is it? I would like to have it in my garden, and so on. Uh, after a few weeks, it was moved to the, to the campus, and then it was observed for another one and a half year. There were quite a lot of elements, so frames and the, and the walls and so on. So we decided to create another uh, tech, it's Tech 04. This time it was created out of panels connected to each other, and those panels actually uh, were made like a one element, which is wall, roof, roof, wall. And here you could uh, see, you can see the section of the wall, corrugated cardboard, honeycomb, corrugated. And it was built in, within a few hours by non professionals, my students from the Faculty of Architecture during the uh, summer workshops in 2018. So the floor was timber, that was the base, then gable wall, and then the, the, the flat element which can be easily transported, because for example, vehicle house, you transport air inside. Here you can have a flat element, then you bend them with the special grooves and then connect. From the outside there is a uh, aluminum sheet and thanks to that we can connect one panel with another. So this is how we imagine that it could, uh, that it could look as a little village uh, of those little uh, temporary houses. Okay, then we did some uh, deeper research about the thermal insulation of the walls because we didn't know if this connection will, will not cause the thermal leakage. So we took the thermal camera and it appeared that it worked good. You can see it was quite cold, minus 25, minus 16, and no thermal leakage uh, inside. So, to sum up, what is paper? Paper is a uh, recyclable, everywhere available material. It's cheap in production and easy to produce. You, you can get it everywhere, actually, in the world. It has good thermal insulation properties. Uh, however, it's vulnerable for water and uh, moisture. It has this creep phenomena, which means that if you have, for example, paper tube and you press it for a longer time with the huge load, it can shrink a little bit. That's why you should use the maximum of one-third of the maximum compression load. Um, yeah, it is combustible, but if I would take this paper tube and try to burn it, it wouldn't be so easy. A friend of us did it uh, in, 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 in um, university in Wuch and they create a little chimney with the gas fire inside and it withstand. Anisotropic means that I told you at the beginning that fibers are in different directions, right? So the anisotropic um, properties, uh, it's a problem uh, for paper. 
And the biggest problem is that it doesn't exist as a building material, and also the people do not trust to this material as a building material. So perhaps all of you know the, the story of the three little pigs. Yeah, they built those three houses, and the wolf came and blow, and only this house uh, withstand. And I was thinking if the th fourth pig would be there with the, with the paper house, would it uh, withstand or not? Thank you so much for your attention. My question is uh, related to, you partially answered it, but let's ask it once again, how you protect the houses from um, the um, water, the fire, and the earthquakes as well. And the earthquakes, okay. Yeah. I'm an engineer, sorry for this <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, that'll be tough. Uh, well, earthquake is easy because the material is flexible. So if, if this would be timber and I would do this, it will break. I can put it back, right? So that was proved by many structures before also with this bracing. The bracing put it, uh, keep it in, intact. However, the, the tubes could move a little bit. Moisture is the biggest threat because when the water goes into the connection between the fibers, then they got loose. That's why you can recycle the material. However, that means that you can make a pulp again. So uh, there are several different solutions. The best is that you have, like in this um, vehicle house, oh, I don't know if I have time to go back, or maybe even here, you have a core which is, which is pure material, and then you cover it. This is how they do with the vehicle house also. You cover it with, the, uh, with something that is waterproof, right? Thanks to that, you can still uh, recycle this core. Otherwise, you can make this watertight, but means that it, you cannot recycle it. Uh, fire. Fire is a big f also problem. We had it with the paper partition system because we use very thin paper tubes, three millimeters, to be easy to drill. And then suddenly the, the firefighters came and they said, nope, you have to dismantle it. Also, they asked us to replace the, the textile because it was just a given by different companies. And then we asked our, uh, our, our partner, company Corex to import, to take the tubes from Finland and Sweden, and they produce them with the, instead of typical glue, like white, white glue, the, 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 the dextrin glue, they use the liquid glass, uh, which is, f normally it's used to, connect, to cover, for example, concrete against the water, but in case of paper, it made it uh, fireproof. So that was the reason. Our friends from Darmstadt University of Technology, they use a uh, thick cardboard from the inside, which was with the phosphor phosphorate, and then it was a barrier that allowed them to reach the, the, the B standard for the German law. So that was one of the, one of the solutions. The um, Japanese pavilion, also built in Hanover in Germany, they wanted to cover it with the, with the polyethylene film, but uh, it was not possible due to the risk of the explosion of terrorist attack, so they had to use PVC uh, as a non-combustible thing. So there are, there are methods. The best would be to have the core as a natural material and then put something from sites to, to cover it. Did I answer? Okay, thank you. <laughs>